Five countries that will collapse by 2100. Putin found out the hard way in 2014 that border changes are currently out of style. After he annexed Crimea, Russia was hit hard with sanctions by the US and Europe, leading to a financial crisis. In the early 21st century, our borders are remarkably stable. In large part, this is due to US hegemony. If you try to mess with international borders, you get the US sanction treatment. We're over a fifth of the way through the 21st century, and what might strike you as odd is that the borders have been remarkably stable over this period. However, don't expect the next eight decades to be as stable. The truth is that most borders simply don't make sense as they are drawn right now, and the main reason they exist in their form is the American Big Brother. This is a map of the world in 1800. The first thing you notice is that there is a pronounced lack of large-scale centralized societies in Central Africa. Asia is split among giant empires or small kingdoms as in India. Now this is the map of the world in 2020. Between these two dates, Western Europe gained an immense advantage over the rest of the Eurasia in an event called the Great Divergence, and thus imposed its concept of the nation-state all across weaker portions of the globe. It worked quite well in the white settler colonies such as in the Americas, Australia, and New Zealand. However, it has shown real strain and early signs of collapse in Africa and the colonized portions of Asia. Simply put, they exist in places they shouldn't. This is why Africa is still so violent and why skirmishes still happen over a frozen piece of land in Kashmir. As the world approaches the year 2100, there are three great trends that would define the 21st century. The first is climate change. The world is warming. Of course, water won't be flooding New York or swamping Florida anytime soon, but the world will become more arid, especially in areas already that are poor and worst able to handle such change. Water resources will become limited and a source of conflict. The second major trend is population growth, again in poorer regions of the world. The population will either stagnate or actually decrease in the industrialized western core, and the numerical decrease could have rather important implications as the world becomes more non-white and the west is forced to accept more brown immigrants for labor. Finally, the decline of relative American power. This is mostly due to the quote-unquote rise of the rest. Non-American powers are rising fast. America will never be as powerful as it was shortly after World War II when it accounted for half of all global manufacturing since its competition was literally rubble. America only has 4% of the world's entire population and it was always fated to have a shrinking piece of the economic pie. In no reasonable world should it account for a quarter of economic output as it currently does. As economies increasingly in line with their population, China will become the economic titan of the world although it remains to be seen if it will overextend itself on the world stage such as the US by virtue of geography and national policy. China appears to be less militaristic in its goals and more driven by economic motives, as seen in the Belt and Road Initiative. Even though most of us think the world is actually globalizing, if you looked at the world, you would think the opposite. There are much more countries now than there were shortly after World War II, primarily due to colonial empires collapsing and the increasing importance of ethnostates. The European empires were never meant to collapse. This is why the nations they spawned are soaked in blood. In our current time, our world is poised between two choices. To become increasingly globalized and united in our efforts or turn away and become more insular. As US power and prestige on the world stage increasingly collapses, accelerated by its poor response to the coronavirus, no power really seems to step forward. China is still a developing nation and nowhere able to fill the vacuum of globe-trotting superpower if America were to withdraw its worldwide presence rapidly. At least during the coronavirus, the world increasingly turned in on itself, shirking away from global entities such as the World Health Organization and leaving each nation to fend for itself. In short, the global order is tending towards anarchy, and unfortunately some nations will not survive such a trend. In response, in this video I look at five nations evaluated on the basis of geography, demography, and the strength of government among other factors. These three factors will be imperative in navigating a multipolar world of anarchy in a do-or-die world. I also picked only one nation from each major block of the world since I could rattle off five African nations but that would make for a boring video. No offense Africa. The Fragile States Index is a convenient measure of how likely a nation is currently to collapse. Most of these nations are in literal civil war and 7 out of the top 10 nations on this list are in Africa. This is primarily because in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, there was literally no precedent for a modern nation state. Before Europeans could penetrate the continent, the central portion was home to communalistic chieftains of fragmented tribes due to extremely sparse pre-colonial populations and the disruption caused by the Atlantic slave trade. 
After Europeans imposed artificial nation states in the late 19th century, Africans were expected to centralize in a mere hundred years, undertaking a process that had taken Europeans millennia and countless brutal and forgotten wars. In comparison to Europe then, Africa is actually building up states in a remarkably peaceful manner. First up, in Africa, the nation that most likely will not exist in its current form in 80 years is the DRC, or the Democratic Republic of the Congo. If Frankenstein were a nation, it would be the DRC. It is the extremely artificial holdover from the brutal days of the Congo Free State under Leopold II. Geographically speaking, it is a humongous, dense jungle with extremely poor infrastructure and scattered settlements. Due to a pronounced lack of roads or railways, the rivers are the lifeline of the nation, although waterfalls and rapids add obstacles here. With 2.3 million square kilometers of land, the country is huge, despite not being very densely settled, with about 84 million people, with a per capita GDP of roughly 100 US dollars in 2006. In terms of demography, the population has a very nebulous Congolese identity, based on French, music, and a shared oppressive history. The many combatants in today's Congo have little incentive to form a united country, and they benefit from the violent chaos so they can pick at the country's resources. Finally, rule of law is practically invisible in most of the nation. Economically, the various outlying parts of Congo are better integrated with their neighbors than with the rest of the country. The only proponents of the Congo is the international community. Once its outside support vanishes, which is almost certainly likely within the next eight decades, the Congo will likely be butchered up into independent states or puppet states of surrounding nations. Rwanda will almost certainly claim the Kivu provinces in its backyard since it routinely intervenes to clear out Hutu rebels. Some close runner-ups for collapse otherwise in Africa include the Central African Republic and the South Sudan, suffering from lack of rule, same as the DRC. The de facto map of control in Central Africa looks like Swiss cheese stood in fighting, which is not a good sign. Second up, let's move to the Middle East. Here we see a large population growth in an increasingly dry and desert climate. Something must give. By far the largest country by population in this region is Egypt, with over 100 million people, and this is what it makes ripe for collapse. Geographically, Egypt is practically all desert, and thus 95% of its population live along the Nile. Even though the government has tried to pull people away to irrigate the land reclaimed from the desert, most people move to the mega cities in search of employment. Demographically speaking, there are way too many young people in Egypt and not enough jobs. And although there is a strong national identity, the nation is reaching breaking point under a brutal and brittle military regime. The lack of water will likely kill Egypt in the end, since they will have to compete with the aspiring breadbasket of Sudan and Ethiopia's dam building program, which use the same water. While Hosni Mubarak was in charge of the government and military, essentially big businessmen known as the whales owned vast swaths of the economy, about 40%. Their stranglehold on the economy created fabulous profits for regime insiders, but blocked opportunities for the vast mass of Egyptians to move out of poverty. If the Egyptian government lost control in the future, foreign powers would likely intervene to keep the Suez Canal open to global shipping. The United States, which uses the canal to move naval forces from the Mediterranean to the Gulf and further east, would swiftly take charge with the token coalition of Saudis and Emirates at the side. Rebels from Libya would likely use the borderlands of Egypt as a rear base. Jihadists would set up a new caliphate on Egyptian turf. Israel will find this intolerable. Egypt will have transformed from a partner in peace to a mortal threat. Israeli jets will bomb Islamic State targets in Egypt as ferociously as they bombed Iranian missile units in Syria. Close contenders for collapse in the Middle East region include Syria, which is essentially crushed due to civil war, and Iraq where Kurds are entrenched in the north. Turkey will most likely expand its influence in this region, like the Ottoman Empire of old. In a desert world, water is king, and Turkey holds practically all the water in this region. Third, we move on to South Asia, home to a quarter of the population of the world and just 3.5% of the world's area. The main contender for the collapse by 2100 is Pakistan, which sits in an immense area of geopolitical friction. Even the British during the partition of India believed that Pakistan would not survive, although against all odds it has propped itself up for the length of a human lifetime. Geographically to the east, its border was drawn by a clueless British diplomat. Although the Tar Desert forms some natural barrier with its arch enemy India, the extremely fertile Punjab region in the north is part of the continuous indo gangetic plain and is separated by a mere fence. This is why conflict is so easy to spark out between these two titans. Contrast this with India and China 
whose heartlands are separated by the Himalayas and miles of Tibetan wasteland. In the west of Pakistan, there is desert and rugged mountain terrain that creates the perfect hiding spot for terrorist insurgents. This is again thanks to the British, who drew the very artificial Durand Line through Pashtun territory and gifted Pakistan with the troublesome northwest frontier province. Pakistan has an arid desert climate and is thus only able to support its 200 million massive growing population due to irrigation of the Indus and its tributaries. Unfortunately, the Indus passes through Indian-controlled Kashmir, which is a geopolitical nightmare, as global warming will constrict water supplies even further in the future. In terms of demography, there is a strong and growing sense of Pakistani nationalism, as you might have witnessed in flame wars on the internet, but this is rooted partially in anti-Indianness. There's mutual distrust among the incredibly diverse Pakistani population of Baloch, Pashtun, Sindhis, and Punjabs. This anti-Indianness also distracts from social inequality, sectarian conflict, and the absence of social progress for many Pakistanis. The breakaway of Bangladesh in 1971 proves that religion alone does not make a nation. In the long term, there are many Indians who think Pakistan will collapse under the weight of its contradictions and the economic crisis. Speaking about the government, right now Pakistan has two paths it can take. It can either continue in the vice grip of a military who is always thinking in terms of the next war of India, or it can peacefully transition into a civilian-led government where economic development and diplomatic ties with India are prioritized. A large, poor, and dissatisfied population will spell disaster, and if Pakistan were to balkanize, we could see the tribal areas being consumed by Afghanistan. Kashmir was swallowed probably by India in its entirety, Punjab and Sindh turning into Indian puppet states since India would not want to consolidate such a large Muslim population, and Balochistan falling under Iranian influence or annexation. As a newly armed state, the U.S. would do everything in its power to secure Pakistani nukes and prevent it from falling to Islamic radicals. The Chinese may also attempt to restore the Pakistani government since it is their only access to the Arabian Sea and contains the CPEC corridor to bypass India. Now we move to Europe. Here the most likely contender for collapse is Russia. Russia has already collapsed twice in history, when the Russian Empire imploded in 1917 to 1921 and the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1990 to 1991. The collapse of the Soviet Union took away half of Russia's population and GDP. It is a wounded beast and is rapidly on the decline. Geographically speaking, its defensive anchors have been obliterated. In Eastern Europe, NATO is now poised to strike at Moscow from the Baltics, and the rich heartland of Ukraine is seesawing between the West and Russia. In Central Asia, the frontier moved to a thousand miles northward, and only a couple of hundred miles from the Ukrainian border. This leaves the Caucasus much more vulnerable and destroys the Soviet Union anchor in the deserts and mountains of Central Asia. Apart from its European core, Russia has a thin very thin tendril of civilization that stretches east to the Pacific. The Russian Far East, which could support much more people, is chronically underpopulated due to a decrease in population and people moving to the cities. The Chinese are slowly undertaking a quite peaceful invasion of Siberia, and in terms of demographic changes, it is likely that the Chinese migrants will outnumber Russians sometime in this century in the Far East. Demographically speaking, Russia is at least much more ethnically Russian than the Soviet Union, with 80% of the population identifying as Russian. A major factor in Russia's potential collapse is a stagnant population and decreasing growth rates. It was hit hard by the two world wars, Russia's civil war and Stalin's famines. These enormous losses came at a time when the Russian population should have grown the most. And after World War II, another massive famine hit the USSR in 1946 and nipped a baby boom in the bud. Russia's population is aging, suffering lower life expectancies, and is compounded by the crippling economic sanction largely due to Western sanctions and over-reliance on oil. Putin is trying to present the image of a strong government, but in reality there are restive republics, especially Chechnya, in the divine Caucasus region. This tiny Muslim republic of 1.4 million people is led by Ramzan Kadyrov, who pledges personal allegiance to Putin, but he could turn at any moment, especially if Putin dies. Many regions of Russia as resent the highly centralized government in Russia, which reallocates resources obtained from the exterior of the nation. Once Putin dies and the Russian economy runs out of steam, we could see real collapse happen. Chechnya could be the first to break off. This would have a dramatic effect on the rest of the North Caucasus region. Neighboring Dagestan, a far bigger and more complex republic than Chechnya, could fragment. A conflict in the Caucasus 
combined with the weakness of the central government in Russia could make other regions want to detach themselves from Moscow as problems. Tatarstan, home to 2 million Muslim ethnic Tatars and 1.5 million ethnic Russians, could declare itself a separate khanate. The Euro region could try to form a republic as it did 1993 along Yekaterinburg. Or it could try to form a union with Siberia. Siberia itself could revive its own identity and try to sell its oil and gas riches to China. China might not have much interest in territory expansion into the sparsely populated Far East and Siberia, but it could and already does colonize these regions economically. Vladivostok and Khabarovsk, two of the largest cities in the Far East, are more economically integrated with China and South Korea than they are with the European part of Russia. Thus, Siberia would become a Chinese puppet state. A dead Russia would be, in fact, America's worst nightmares. As with the collapse of Pakistan, Russia's nuclear weapons would immediately have to be secured lest they fall into the wrong hands. The fate of Russia depends on how well it handles the passing of Putin. If a smooth transfer of power happens and Russia lays low, it could perhaps squeak along for the rest of the century as an irrelevant relic of the past. Finally, the fifth nation that would likely get destroyed by 2100 is North Korea. The miracle here is that North Korea even exists. An enclave of absolute despotism where the state owns everything and people are consigned to a virtual lifetime in prison somehow has survived for three generations. Geographically, it is sandwiched between much richer powers, China and South Korea. And in terms of demography, it is only home to about 25 million impoverished people, half of South Korea's population. However, history reveals that since World War II, no other family dictatorship has even managed to pass power for a third time. If North Korea dies, it will likely be due to a succession crisis. A common characteristic of family dictatorships is rapid and often unexpected collapse. Most failed regimes disintegrate completely in less than a year from the first signs of crisis. The Chinese will be likely be the first to react owing to their geographic proximity. The US and South Korea would also seek to invade and secure all of the nuclear weapons. The truth is the plan for a fail in North Korea is somewhat murky, and the precise events will be up to the leaders of that time. Whew, that was a lot. Uh, tell me what nations you think will or will not survive by the year 2100 in the comments below. How accurate do you think my predictions will turn out to be? Well, let's debate that in the comments below. Thanks for watching. As always, if you want more great content, if you want to keep supporting this channel and invest in this channel, go check out my Patreon link in the description below. Thanks for watching and make sure to subscribe for more great content. This is Scholar of the World, signing out.